Welcome home. Don't you like? <laughs> you can clap. Welcome home. We've been looking forward to this time because kids are going back to school and it's a natural time to regather and it's so nice to see you all here. And I just want to welcome you home. If you're online, welcome home. Wish you were here with us, but welcome home. Isn't it nice to kind of picture those images of having been away and receiving the hug and the love? I got air hugs this morning, and that felt really, really good. And I'm really excited to be back, and it's been a good time to kind of step back. Our leadership, I was a little tired actually real tired, more tired than I've ever been in my whole life. After about 18 months of redlining and just pushing all my gauges, emotional, mental, physical, all of that to the max for the season that we've been through. And so I've gotten a chance just to take a breath. And so if you're struggling and you're really tired, maybe you're a little anxious, maybe a little depressed, join the crowd. You're not alone. We've been through a lot, and, and it's not over. And I just want to encourage you that Jesus, when he was overwhelmed, what did he do? He went to a quiet place, and he got away with his disciples. And he, and he restored himself. He, 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 he spent some time with God. Now, if the Son of God, who is God, needs to do that, then don't, don't we need to do that sometimes? And then, then I was reading through Old Testament and Elijah and the whole idea of him going up against the 450 uh, prophets of uh, Baal and doing the whole uh, altar thing and then killing all, all of them and being worn out and then outrunning Ahab in his chariot for a marathon or whatever. Then he was worn out. And what did God do? He took him away to a place, and, and he restored his soul. And we see the picture of him being on the mountain and, and God you know, coming in a storm. And, 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 and he wasn't in the storm and in the wind and, and in all of those things, but, but he came in the whisper, didn't he? And that's what God wants to do for you today is to whisper life and encouragement to inspire you and to remind you who you are and to give you hope at this time. And as our kids are going back to school and we regather and, and things are painful and p things are uncertain and there's chaos, but we have one thing and that is God is in control and we can put our faith and we can put our trust in him because he's a good God and he's a good, good father and he is in the control of our lives, your life together. And I just want to remind you of that today. If you are where I was, a little tired, actually real tired. I had a friend not long ago that passed away, and before this all occurred, I was leaning into his life, and I was loving him, and I wasn't sure where his relationship was with God and we talked about Jesus, and, and he thought I was the janitor of the church for the first six months he knew me. 
because I said one day, I said, I have a wedding this Saturday, and he thought I had to set up the chairs and the tables. <laughs> and, and that's an important role. I'm not making fun of that, but he just didn't know who I was. And so our relationship went on and grew, and, and I leaned into him for his own health. I could say to him, hey, you know, there's some things wrong, and your blood pressure is way too high, and you need to do something about it. And just spoke words of encouragement and love into him, and at the same time represented Christ. Well, he later died, but before he died, he, he asked me this question. Chris, is there something more? Is there more than all of this? And I said to Andy, yes, Andy, there is something more. And your life matters, and you are loved by a father. And did you know, I mean, do you know Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior of your life? And he said he did. And so, and I had his funeral, and I miss him so much because he was just one of those guys that you just love to be around, just love to tease and to pick on and to get him going. I just enjoy, I mean, that's the, I don't, the quirky side of my personality, that, that I, I just love those kind of people that have this, <clears throat> and then I love to <clears throat> them back. <laughs> Sorry. So in this season that we are all approaching in and we are regathering in, I just want to encourage you to do this one thing, and it is to stay positive. We have went through a season where all we did, or at least all I thought we did, was grumble and complain. And we, we, we were all over the place. And while the world is divided, folks, the church needs to be united. And we need to stay positive because we've got the hope, don't we? And, and if negativity outweighs positive five to one, I'm told. If you've got one negative person on your team, they can slow your team down to, down to 50% or less. So let's be positive. And in fact, the Bible actually speaks to that in Philippians chapter 2, verse 14. He, Paul says, do all things without grumbling or disputing. And before we go there, I want to say, let's say this together. Stay positive. Stay positive. You know, it's really good. Balcony, are you up there? Uh, stay positive. Stay positive. Man, see, they, they care about half the way. Good job, Balcony. Thanks for being there. Online, nudge the person that you're drinking coffee with, having your cereal, and, and uh, in the bathroom next to you, say, stay positive. No response. <laughs> Put it up on the chat. All right. Moving along, let's say this together because this is a scriptural counsel for us. Say it together. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Let's say that again. Do all things without grumbling or disputing. Let's make that a mark of our lives to stay positive. We're not done. It ain't over until it's over, and there's no finish line in this whole thing. And so let's just stay positive and put our trust and our hope in God who loves us, loves you with a crazy, crazy radical love. I was talking to a family, and I can't remember who it was, or I would tell you who it was. And they were at the beach down in Florida, and they got into a riptide. Now, us Midwesterns don't really understand or appreciate a riptide. I've never experienced one. In fact, I had a youth group kid. We were out in California on a mission trip, and we'd been in El Pavanir, which is near Ensenada, which is near Tijuana, and we were in San Diego having a day off. And one of my kids, who wasn't with me, not in my van, so it's not my fault, but he got caught in a riptide. And he nearly drowned, and he came to me, and I was a very sensitive youth pastor. He came to me and said, Chris, I nearly drowned in riptide. I said, well, I'm glad you're okay. <laughs> no, you don't understand. I nearly drowned. I was so worn out. A lifeguard came to get me. I'm, you know, in my mind, I'm visiting, having to call his mom. <laughs> hey, by the way, he drowned. Not a good scenario for a youth pastor. But the idea of 
a riptide is that the waves hit, but in this particular part of the beach, when the waves hit, they kind of circle and they go way out. And, and, and if you try to fight that current of coming back when, when it's going way out, you exhaust yourself because you can't fight the current. I was watching the news. I was, at, I was in Fort Myers for seven days with my mom and dad. Hey, mom and dad, I know you're watching online on the YouTube that I set, on, set up on your 80-inch TV that dad said that I couldn't set up because you already had an expert that said that it couldn't happen, but I did it. <laughs> and I want credit as the oldest son who loves you, who spent seven days on your couch, that I helped you in spite of protest and grumbling and complaining. <laughs> but I did. And here's the deal. We all drift, don't we? And when we get that riptide in our life, when we've just experienced one of those riptides, guys, and, and we're trying to fight it back in, and, and we need to swim parallel, and we need to call others for help and support, because it's been a struggle. And, and it's a choice that we have when we drift because we are responsible for our drift. And God can, we can either drift or God can give us a direction in our life and he has a desire to take us somewhere. And it's just not to drift. But it's been so easy to drift, hasn't it? Because all of our habits, all of the things, all of our go-tos basically have been taken away. And, and I didn't know this, but mental illness is actually typically around 15%. And so some of you are part of that 15%. And I love you. But the thing is that it's grown from 15% to 40 to 50% of people are dealing with some mental challenges like myself a little anxious, a little depressed, a little restless, a little tired. That's the new normal. And so we just really have to stay positive. We have to give each other grace. And there's a tendency right now for us to drift. And we need to seek God and keep his hand and his direction on our lives. Something we've got to realize is that 92% of us believe in God, but most of us feel distant and disconnected from God. And it, again, it's easy for us to do because the drift has been so strong that we are missing that deep connection, that, that caring, that process of being together. And today, I, I, I recruited David Peggy, or the main organizers of the cookout after church, but I've got the grill kings with us today. And I'm super excited because they volunteered to help us cook and make this happen so that we could spend some time eating and sharing and fellowshipping after church together because guess what? It's important. We need each other. We should love each other as family. And that's, that's incredibly important. It's, in fact, vital for our lives, for my life, for your life. Now let's realize that there are a million reasons that we can get caught up in the undertow or the riptide to pull us a long way down the beach away from God. There's all kinds of stuff. We're really super, super busy. We go and go and go. Or we've not been able to go and go and go. And so we've changed things, but it's not quite working the way it was. And that is natural because we are human beings, we are imperfect, we fail, we sin. And, and the reason is, it's, Isaiah says it best in chapter 53, verse 6, he says, We, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. We all go astray. We've all turned away at different times. But the Lord has brought Jesus Christ to us and his sacrifice was enough for us to bring us back in relationship with God. Now, think about this. To the, be the best version of ourselves, to be the best version of ourselves, 
there has to be a spiritual awakening. And you say, well, Chris, I, I confessed Jesus a long, long time ago. I repented. I baptized him. I'm a regular in church. I do my devotions. And I say, beyond that, folks, that there are times, different times in our lives where we have awakenings. More than just that. Over this last you know, month, I've just had an awakening. I've just had a real time of reflection and a real time of getting in touch. And you might call this prayer, you might call this mindfulness. I don't know how you classify it, but it's taking a, a deep, deep breath and taking a, what do I want to say, kind of a spiritual gut check, a, a spiritual examination of my own life and say, who am I, where am I, what am I doing why, what, what is going on? And how does that fit into the big scheme of things? And for me, that was an awakening. And for you, it may be different at a different stage of your spiritual development. But to realize that there's something going on and, and God is speaking to us in this time period and we don't ever want to miss what we can learn and how we can grow in a time of challenge and testing like we've experienced. I don't want to go back to the way it was. I want a new way and a fresh start and a new beginning and a, a fresh breath of the Spirit of God in our lives and in our church. Amen. Saying all of that, that spiritual awakening is created because some things are going on in our lives and to go to some high theology and high philosophy I, I really felt like I needed to go to the Rolling Stones for that this morning and I want you to think about this fill the blank in you can't always get what you want. let's try that again you can't always get what, what does that signify or you two Bono you two ever he heard of them this is, this is a song that I like. I still haven't found hmm, what I'm looking for. I still haven't found. You see, art and music reveal something, kind of a universal hunger in our lives. Now, for a first service, this was the one they knew the best. Johnny Lee, looking for love. <laughs> Even in this service. Looking for love in all the long, wrong pl pr places. Praise Anyway, Mick Jagger. Can't hardly do this. I can't get no because why? I try and I try and I try. So in art and music, there's this universal hunger. There's this universal longing. And today we're going to look at a passage of Scripture in Luke chapter 15, a story that we've all known and we've heard at different times in our lives. And, and I believe the young man's song would have been, I still haven't found what I'm looking for. And I think we can relate because we have a lot. You may not realize this, but we have a lot. And yet we are still searching or something more. Let's look at Luke chapter 15, verses 11 and 12. If you've got a tablet, if you've got a phone, if you've got your hard copy Bible, if you're on U version, I haven't given this little commercial lately, but Y O U V E R S I O N is an app. It's got hundreds of devotions, hundreds of different versions. In fact, again, mom, dad, I put it on my mom's iPad and and she wasn't super excited. All I want is scripture, Chris. I do not want the devotions. We got some great devotions. And some of you join me with those devotions. So please use that app. Luke 15, 11 and 12, it says, There was a man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give them the share of the property that is coming to me. And he divided his property between them. In this moment, this younger son was asking for something that we can't understand. I've been involved with inheritances and wills at different times at different stages of my life, but this time in history, in biblical history, 
This was an honor culture, and this was a dishonorable act. Now, the youngest son had the right to ask, but the father had the right to refuse and to basically do what the younger son did was basically saying to his father, Dad, I wish you were dead. You're not important to me. I don't care about you. I want what I want, what I want right now. And it had to crush the father. And <laughs> I've told my kids, you ain't getting it till I'm dead. <laughs> Haven't you? But this father allowed this son to have what he wanted. And it had to break his heart. But in this act, this son revealed three longings, three longings that I believe we all experience. And the first longing was this. He was longing for purpose. He was longing for a purpose. And, and the question in that moment is, why do I exist? What good am I? What, what is my contribution to the overall good? Why do I matter? And we all have this God-implanted longing for purpose, and that longing is what draws us back home to God. In fact, the last four weeks, the guys have preached, and they did a great job on spiritual gifts. And, and they talked about why you were made and how you were gifted and how we are designed for, for serving others and, and basically to have a purpose-driven life. And when I think about that, I still refer back at different times to Rick Warren's book, The Purpose-Driven Life, to, to look at why we are made for what we are made for. And, and CJ said it so well last week when he, when he said... Uh, we all have different gifts. There's like a bazillion different ways our gifts work, and we're not all the same, but we all serve the same God. But to find that spiritual sweet spot, we need to use it and to serve. And, and something that we just did this last week, because I was talking to a young woman that said, you know, I'm not finding fulfillment in my job. I'm making a lot of money. In fact, I'm afraid of doing anything else because I can't make the money, but I'm not finding the meaning and the purpose in my life. And as she was sitting through this series, she was trying to figure out what her giftedness is. This is just an aid. This is on our website. It'll be under uh, spiritual gifts. And, and the guy who designed this, this is free to us, is uh, Dr. Jim uh, Dennison. And what... Dr. Dennison does is every day he writes a blog and talks about what is going on in culture and how it re relates to scripture. It's very practical. You may not agree with everything. I don't agree with everything, but he provides this spiritual gifts analysis just as an aid for you to be able to start in one area of your life because you are gifted. You have a purpose to serve God in a way, and only you can do it. And if it doesn't get done, it's because you didn't do it. And that is a real calling on your life. And I hope you hear me as I speak into you in regard to that, because you have a purpose, and we all long for purpose. The second longing we see in this passage of Scripture is a longing for love, a longing for love. And as I was doing this introspection, reflection thing, I was thinking, you know, I am missing the people that were in my life before this all happened. But because this has happened, we haven't been able to gather. We haven't been able to connect. We haven't had the life groups that we've had. The adult Bible fellowships haven't been as strong. And, and now's the time to get back together. Notice in Luke chapter 15, verse 13, this is how this longing is expressed. It says, not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country, and there he squandered his property in reckless living. I want you to think of Vegas and the red light district in New York City and Amsterdam 
and any terrible, awful, sexually explicit website, whatever. This is where this younger son went to try to fulfill that longing of love in his life. And we got to re remember that we've all been created with a deep desire for connection. In fact, this idea of isolation versus togetherness or connectedness is a mental health issue that we need each other. Someone said, I think it was Malcolm Malkridge, but I may be wrong. He said, anyone who has ever knocked on the door of the house of prostitution is looking for God. Isn't that a strange connection? But that's because we are looking for love, not in a place of health, spiritual health and wellness, because of that need or connectedness that we all have. So this morning we've been looking at longings for purpose, for love, but the, the last one is this, a longing for meaning. A longing for meaning. You say, well, Chris, purpose and meaning are pretty close. Well, not exactly, because purpose, we're talking about what is your purpose. And when we're looking for meaning, our culture is wrestling with this, and I think we as Christians are wrestling with the big why questions of life. Why did children die of disease? Why did this person die at this time? Why did this divorce happen? Why was there this loss or that loss? Why is this pandemic happening? Why is it continuing to go on? The, the why questions of life that give our lives meaning and purpose and significance. Why? And, and when we come down to those whys, the big why questions of life, we realize what do we really, really believe. And this longing for something more these longings serve the greatest spiritual awakening, awakening for our lives. When we, when we think about what we've gone through, what we're going through, what we will go through, there's really one answer for all of that, isn't there? It's our faith and our trust in our God. Is He a loving, caring God that wants the best for us? And a lot of times he gets blamed for all of this, doesn't he? And really where we should place the blame is the author of death and destruction and despair, which is Satan. There's a war that's going on in every one of our souls. And, and, and who we listen to and how we approach our lives, either in faith or in doubt, makes all the difference in the world, doesn't it? Our attitude in knowing that God that gives us purpose and meaning, who loves us? Do we believe in him? Do we really, really believe in him? This morning, I wanna look at three applications just quickly. The first application is that right now, if you're struggling, if you've gone through a difficult time like I have, then you know what? Those people that don't know Jesus Christ, Lord and Savior, that don't have meaning, don't have purpose, don't have love in their life, how bad off are they? They need Jesus. They need a relationship with God. So invite someone to join you on site, here in the present, physically, or online. Have a watch party at your house. If you're online and you know some other people that are struggling, that are just like you, Invite them to your house and, and say, hey, this is working. This is helping. This leads me to spiritual health. And, and there is a God that's making the difference in my life. The other thing is if you're online or in person, join our Next Steps experience. Take that next step. For uh, on the first or second Sunday of the month, we have a, an opportunity 
to sit down and, and to gather and say, here's what we believe, here's what we do, here's your next step of growth, here's your spiritual gift, how can we help you uh, grow? And that's what Next Step's about. We can still grow. In fact, we ought to grow even stronger in times like these. And finally, third, if you will, boldly pray for the next 21 days. God, if you are real, make yourself real to me. For you that are doubting, you're not even sure that God exists and all this God talk, you're online because somebody made you or you just are giving it one last chance. But God, if you were real, make yourself real to me. And I believe he'll answer that prayer. If you'll seek him, he will show himself real to you. This morning, as every Sunday morning, we're going to extend an invitation. And, 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 and the challenge is just making that next step in your relationship with God, whatever that is. Will you take that next step? Will you please stand as I pray? Eternal God and Father, we are grateful for the work that you do, for the love that you have, that you answer those longings, and you are the only one that can answer those longings in our lives. That you're vitally important. You are a God that loves, that cares, that creates, that exists, that moves, that strengthens, inspires, and encourages. And Father, we just ask for those that have those needs and those longings that that you would move mightily in their lives. Father, for those that doubt your existence, I don't know how they live, Father, without the hope that we can have in you, without the trust and the faith that it's beyond us, but we can put our faith and trust in you. I, I just pray that you place a seed of hope, a place, a seed, to start spiritual birth and rebirth in our lives, to know that you are a God who cares, who loves, that gives meaning to all of this. And Father, we just ask for those that have never confessed Jesus as Lord and Savior of their lives, never submitted a baptism, who've never repented, Father, that do not have the Spirit of God residing in them. We pray, Father, that you would uh, make it happen, that do the work that only you can do. And we pray, Father, this all in faith, in Jesus' name.